right, well, hey, good morning and welcome again to Shorepoint. It's great to see so many faces back from France. We had an incredible time. Um, I know the team got back last Friday, but we were like, hey, we're in France. Uh, maybe we should hang out in Paris just a day or two longer. So we did. We had a great time. It was awesome to be back. I had more Nutella crepes than I should have. Um, but you're walking everywhere in Paris, so it's like guilt-free. You know, you're like, hey, I can, I can have another and another. So it was a great time. Uh, but more than uh, crepes, I did want to come back with a really awesome report. Um, God is moving wherever he wants to move. You know what I'm saying? I, I guess I'm sharing that because when I hear France, and I, I think of post-Christian, and oh man, the culture's just gone. How could God move in France? And I'm telling you, we went, walked into that church service, it felt like home. There were greeters, everybody was happy to be here, the place was packed, worship was off the charts, and I'm looking around saying, God, you are moving wherever you want to move. The church is alive, Jesus' kingdom is advancing, make no mistake about it, and I want you to know that you're sowing. When you give uh, your tithe and then we tithe into missions, I want you to know you're sowing into good soil, that God is moving in France right now as a result of people saying yes to the go and then faithful tithes and, and offerings. So I want to say thank you for that. And it's so cool. The vision they have, it's just amazing to plant more churches, and we want to be a part of that as a church plant. we got a heart for that, and we're excited about it. A couple of things to make you aware of before I get into the message this morning. Uh, if you're newer to the church, you maybe aren't familiar with the fact that we start the year out with 21 days of prayer and fasting, saying, God, what do you have for us this year? What's your vision for our lives, for the church? And um, one of the things we did coming out of 21 days is we said, you know what? Fasting and praying shouldn't just be this one, like, one-off that we do at the beginning of the year. We should be people of prayer and people who fast. So uh, we called, or decided to call the last Wednesday of every month as a day just to fast and pray as a church. Uh, that's not a uh, requirement to be a part of the church, uh, but it is a massive invitation. Let's pray this upcoming Wednesday. is the last Wednesday of the month. Let's be praying, fasting, asking God to do wonderful things in our own lives and in this church. I'm telling you right now, there are things we need to see God move in on behalf of his church today, be fasting and praying and asking God to do great and wonderful things. I also heard um, while I was gone, uh, we had, and I'm not surprised at all, two of my good friends, John and Paul, came in. I watched Paul's message. I, I just was, I was blown away. I was laughing. I was crying. Um, I'm not surprised. But I love that the heartbeat of this church is to go out and serve its community. It re the, the call to go resonated with our church. And I want to say thank you to every single person who went out and was a part of Serve Week this last week. I think we got one more event tonight with the youth. So uh, we want that to be a catalyst. Again, not a one-off, but we just want to be a church that serves our city and is known for that. Uh, that being said, uh, I want to turn and transition now into uh, our, our next series. And again, I'll, I'll allude back to January. We felt like God put it on our heart, the vision on our heart. And by the way, I love seeing the uh, This Means War hats. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Um, but at the beginning of the year, we were like, God, what's your heart and vision for the year? And we just genuinely felt compelled that with everything that's been going on in our own lives, with everything that's going on at the church, that this means war. That the enemy might be attacking, but God is advancing his kingdom. That he's the victorious one, and we can step into battle knowing the victory is already won. But this means war. And uh, we're starting a new series today that I know is going to cause some people to, like the, that part of their spine that tightens when the preacher preaches, this is that series. You know what I'm saying? I know it. We're, we're going to get right into a series on our finances. Woo! Because here's the truth. This is a war, and part of the war is how we handle, how we see, and what we do with our finances. Jesus talked about money a lot, and I'd imagine even in that crowd there was the, oh, oh he's talking about money, oh. Listen, I'm here to tell you just as a church, first of all, Jesus talked a lot about it, so we're going to talk about it. We're going we're gonna to say, okay, Jesus is after something when he's talking about this. But how many of you know that I don't preach from a place of need and acting as if God is broke? That is the wrong perspective on giving and tithing and finances. God's not broke. Your pastor's not desperate for a new minivan. Come on, baby, I love my white minivan. Don't you dare think I'm out for my new minivan. That's not what it's about. 
We're not preaching from a secret need that nobody else in the church knows about and we're just hurting and, and oh man, we need, oh, we need giving to go up. We are all in the black. We have, we're not preaching out of this secret need. We're very open about our finances. I would also say, probably to a fault, this is, a, this is something I haven't taught enough, to be quite honest with you. We talked about it two Sundays last year, and if you've ever been, if you've been coming to our church since 2020, you'll notice we don't even receive an offering on Sunday. And it's like, oh, uh, and some people love that. They're like, I'm, you know, and it's not actually this, like, intentional thing, except I just want to leave as much time as possible to get into the worship and the word. So I'm like, well, let's just trust that God's going to take care of of us and let's teach tithing and let's mention it and and we have seen God meet all of our needs so I'm laying a foundation that I'm not preaching this out of fear we're not arm twisters here but I do believe this that there is a battle going on for your finances just so you know there is a battle going how many of y'all feel that battle you know what I'm saying I know that battle's going on well we want to talk about it but before we do I want to invite my friend Chase to come up and and I said Chase I, I, I want I want every week I would love to start this series uh, just with a, a conversation, an interview, if you will, with people who are living what we're teaching. You know what I'm saying? Which, which sounds like a tall order, and it doesn't mean Chase is perfect at what we're teaching. It means he's living it. He's stepping into things. So I thought it'd be great if we could just have a conversation. And I asked the team, I love this, I asked the team, could you set up a bit of a family room vibe? Because I don't want it to feel like we're starting off preaching. And man, I got to say, you guys really outdid yourselves. It's just... Amazing. I just can't believe our production team. It's just awesome. So thank you for that. And uh, the only thing missing is some coffee. <laughs> I just I need my coffee. You know? Right, exactly. We just need the cups of coffee. But, but uh, Chase, I'm, I'm just going to kind of kick it off and just say, hey, you know, could you explain a little bit of the process and how it started for you and Allie? I know Allie's helping with kids right now, but maybe you could share a little bit about as a couple, what did it look like with the area of finances, tithings and offerings? How did it start in your marriage? Yeah, um, I think we both kind of had the framework for tithing and giving generosity um, because of our families, our parents, um, which has also been a challenge to us because our parents gave that to us and we didn't even realize it. Um, she grew up with parents that were faithful in tithing. Um, they gave above and beyond, just modeled generosity. I did too. Um, I saw my parents um, do that and they helped us participate even when, like with our allowance or whatever, like, hey, you give give of that. So I think there was a framework. That's so great. How many of y'all grew up where your parents helped you learn, like, the tithe through allowance? You know what I'm saying? That's awesome. Yeah, that one, that 10 cents, right? You give it. Um, so that, and then I was a missionary kid, so I got to see generosity, tithing, in a third world country growing up, um, people that had nothing faithfully give. And so I think that definitely impacted. So it gave us the framework of tithing and generosity. Obviously, it's taught in scripture. Um, but it's like at some point, the rubber has to hit the road, right? And I think when we were dating to get married, uh, we had those conversations like, are we going to tithe? Are we going to be generous? Are we going to give above and beyond? Like, what are our goals? Um, and we decided when we got married, like, hey, this is we're going to be faithful to this. Um, and I think that's when the real war started because you have to actually do it. Um, and it was a daily battle. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like you have all the energy and passion when you start out and you're like, yep, we're going to do this. And then you're like, okay, we have $85,000 in school debt and my first job's not really cutting it. So that's when you have to have those real honest conversations around like, are we going to be faithful to do this um, when it means trusting God with everything, you know? So that kind of set us up for it. Um, and I will say like, there was a lot of awkward conversations along the way, you know, because money was tight and we both knew we would look at Chase Bank and be like, okay. Chase Bank, like the Chase Bank? The or is this the name of your <laughs> bank account? The Chase Bank. Okay, cool. Just yeah, start. The Chase Bank. I wish. Um, <laughs> but you know, just looking at that and just, I think we began to be faithful with what we had and knowing like, Hey, at some point you just have to trust and see, right? Like I kept thinking of that verse that like came back in Psalms where it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's like, at some point you have to like trust and see that the Lord is good. Like he'll provide. And we're like, okay, we've got all this that's going to school debt, like all of this, you know, and it, it doesn't, when you write it out on paper, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's the whole thing is like, for us, the real conversation came with our heart and being like, following Jesus is a call to surrender. And 
we had this honest conversation. I remember when we were like dating to be married, where it was like, is this our faith or our parents' faith? Like, are we actually going to, so like, I remember, I think Allie actually told me, she was like, do we like really trust Jesus with our souls, but we don't trust him with our finances? And it's like, you know, and that's come back up too uh, over the years because in every season there's different challenges, right? Um, so we began to be faithful and we began to see God provide in incredible ways. Um, and I'm cautious because I don't like to say like, hey, we give to receive. Like that's not why we give. We give and surrender to Jesus and he changes our hearts and then creates something where you want to give more. Uh, but I was telling Brian like um, our first house, it was a crazy situation. We ended up having to move and we bought the house for literally nothing. Um, and I think we sold it for two times what we bought it for. And it was enough to cover, like, all of our debt. Like, in that time, we never saw that in that two years. We never saw that coming, right? Like, we were just faithful. Hey, we've got to be faithful. We've got to be faithful to give. And then we saw that provision. And what that did for us was it became an altar moment. Um, in the Old Testament, like, you see the people of God, every time God would show up and he would move in an incredible way, like, they built altars to worship and remember, like, what God did. And so we just decided early on in our marriage, like, hey, we're going to build these altar moments. So, like, that house and that debt, that became an altar moment. So then, like, nine years later when it's like, oh, man, things are super tight, right? Like, we have kids now and money is like, where is it all going? Um, we look back and remember, like, hey. I'm very familiar with the where is it all going <laughs> feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Target and Amazon, right? Like. But um, I think you have to look back and you just remember, like, hey, those altar moments along the way where, like, God provided above and beyond. And I think so that was kind of the framework of how we decided, like, hey, we're going to give and we're going to continue to give. I love that. Can you, could you just share, like, I mean, that's a how many year process? That, Eleven years. Eleven year process. Um, could you just rattle off maybe some of the emotions that you felt, like ups and downs? I mean, I would imagine there's a lot that goes into that just emotionally that you're processing through. Yeah, I think, um, like, initially, like, just fear, you know, worry, anxiety, um, especially, like, as a man, like, I felt, like, this just desire to, like, hey, I've got to provide. I want to make sure I have all this stuff for my family. Um, so there was definitely, like, anxiety and in that and in, in trusting but then on the other side there was like um just incredible joy and in, in this peace that came like um you know I still like I'm younger younger and a younger adult not a young adult but um you know I still I still I'm probably one of the last people that does a check for my tie like through my bank and it's because like I just there's some joy that you receive when you choose every week you know I get paid every week to like this is God's and I did that intentionally for me. I'm not saying everybody has to do it, but just, like, I knew I'm, I want to keep my own heart in check. And so, um, yeah, so. That's awesome. Uh, so just as we wrap up, just any word of encouragement, which I've, I think have already been an encouragement, but any word of encouragement for those who might feel like they're struggling in this area? Yeah, I just say, like, you have to start somewhere. Um, to be perfectly honest, like, I didn't start with 10%. I started with something. And I was like, God, if, I, if you're faithful with that, then I'll, I'll give more. Well, of course, God is going to be faithful. <laughs> so, yeah, it, go, it grew beyond 10%, right? But, like, I think it's just taking that step of faith to say, like, hey, God, I trust you. I've given you my life. I'm going to surrender all to you. Um, I'm going to give every part of you. And that's the call to follow. So just start somewhere. Trust God. He's going to be faithful. You're going to see it in, in a million different ways, um, which is, that's the beauty of serving God serving Jesus is like you're going to see and experience that faithfulness um, and then build those altar moments along the way where you look and you remember like hey that was the moment when God did this and I would also say like if you think it's just a financial blessing it, you're missing it like I was saying about this Friday night I had some buddies over from Shorepoint and just thinking about like God's faithfulness and blessing comes in so many different ways in your life but just like community friendships people that have become family like in every area of your life, you'll experience that blessing that comes when you're faithful to surrender the, those things to him. I love that. Hey, can we just show our appreciation to Chase real quick? Thanks so much, buddy.
And as I get into the message this morning, I want to pray for us real quick. God, I believe that's your heart for every person in this room, just uh, for, to go from fear to faith, to go from uh, anxiety or concern into absolute trust and joy, God. That, that even as we talk about finances, God, and the fight for our finances, that it wouldn't be a drag, Lord, but it'd be something where we experience and encounter your victory, your peace, your kindness in. And I thank you that you have that for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. I do want to say thank you to Chase and Allie. It takes a lot to come up and say, hey, I'm going to talk about finances. So I want to honor that. And thank you so much, my friend. And uh, I know you have a hot tub over at the house. So I want to be one of those friends. I'm just saying, just you go ahead and text me anytime. I'm there. Uh, Beth can watch the kids. So. Uh, <laughs> But this morning, as I get into the message, like, why is it a fight for our finances? I, and I'm going somewhere with this because I'll occasionally hear, uh, like, again, like, if, if this gets brought up in church, or especially if you're talking to people who aren't in church and they have a perspective on the church, that, that we act like God's broke, or that, that the, the pastor just wants the flashy whatever, or that um, the church just wants your money. And this morning, I want to challenge that, and I'm going to ask you to stay with me here, because I am not attacking any one of the things I'm about to say, but I'm trying to point something out here, that I wonder if there really isn't a fight for our finances, and we're blaming the wrong person. We're blaming the wrong person. Uh, if the church just wants all our money, well, let's take a practical look at where all of our money is actually going. Somebody say amen, so I know you're, all, you're still with me. You know what I'm saying? All right. No, so listen to this. Check this out. The average household spends $3,500 in entertainment annually. Uh, average sports fan spends $664 on their teams per year. Uh, let's go bucks, right? Come on, somebody. It's okay. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not bashing this. But listen to this. $150 billion was spent in 2022 on sports equipment alone in the United States. But the church just wants your money. Okay, I'm going to keep going. In the most recent study we have on the misuse of alcohol, it's a 14-year-old study. 2010, they did a study on the cost of the misuse of alcohol. Studies have found that $250 billion are lost every year in America on the misuse of alcohol. And that's a 14-year-old stat. The same study said a heavy drinker spends up to $5,000 a year on alcohol. Tell me God just wants your money. Or maybe there's something else happening here. The average cost per person for a, spring, or for a uh, vacation is $2,000 per person. Again, I love me some vacation. I am all about it. We save up. We go. I actually have a little principle in my life. Live below my means and vacation above them, baby. Come on, somebody. That's my little wisdom for you today. So I'm not against vacation, but I will say this, that last year during summer break alone, Americans spent $200 billion on vacation. Uh, I'm going to skip a few stats here and get right to the one we're all wondering how much money goes into one Taylor Swift concert? $93 million. I haven't heard a single person tell me Taylor Swift just wants my money. I'm just saying maybe there's something bigger happening here. And maybe there's an adversary, an enemy here who's trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Because listen to this. I didn't want this actually to be about the church not wanting your money. I wanted to point out that there's an enemy who does. Because listen to what happens with uh, the effects of overspending and debt in our lives. 54% of U.S. adults with debt say they, are, they always or are often stressed because of their debt. 72% stated that they were somewhat or very likely to accumulate more debt when experiencing stress. This is a cycle. Who puts us in cycles of stress and anxiety? Okay. <laughs> Due to debt, 48% have reported sleep problems. 40% had higher anxiety, 38% led diminished social lives, and 34% experienced depression. 
Listen to the effects of overspending and debt in our relationships. 60% said it led to disagreements with those they loved. 55% said it resulted in lost trust. 55% said it resulted in tension. 86% said debt was hurting their relationships. Disagreement, lost trust, stress, guilt, anxiety, depression, none of that is from Jesus. So I'm just here to say there is a fight for our finances because there is a very real enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm here to tell you God does not want those things for your life. I'm not here to condemn. I'm here to call you up and call you out. That anxiety, that stress, that fear is not what God has for your life. God wants you and I thriving in our relationships. Romans 12, 18 tells us as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. God wants peace in our relationships. God wants us living free from guilt. Romans 12 or Romans 8, 38 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We're not supposed to be living with guilty, heavy, hung heads over our finances. God doesn't want us to be a slave to anything. Galatians 5, 1 says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. This isn't about God wanting your money. This is about the enemy going after you. He wants your money. He wants you in debt. He wants you living in stress and anxiety, fear about the, what tomorrow's going to bring and feeling like you can't possibly afford to tithe or to be generous. He wants you bound up. There is a real fight for our finances. So in this series, I'm going to fight back. With the word of God. In one of Jesus' most well-known messages that we call the Sermon on the Mount, we'll see him go after this very issue. And each week what I want to do, my, my hope is that each week we address heart issues. Because while the enemy might be after your money, God is actually after your heart. So we're not, we're not just going to talk uh, the, the building blocks for financial freedom, and we're not just going to talk about tithing and offering and generosity. We're going to talk about the heart issues behind each of those. And each week I want to ask one question for us, and the first question this week is coming out of Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus is teaching, and he says this, Matthew 6, 24. I'm going to take a, a real quick drink here of water. Was that clear? Hey, if Paul can say what he said last week, I can say that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. <clears throat> you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is laying it out very plainly and clearly for you and I. We can't serve God and serve money. Now, when Jesus is talking about money, there's two trains of thought that a lot of scholars have, have considered. The first one is that Jesus is literally talking about wealth, money, riches, the attaining uh, of things, and uh, needing things, the accumulation of stuff. And Jesus is saying you can't serve both God and money. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. But there's another perspective, too, that some have said this in the original Hebrew, the word that Jesus actually used was mammon. And uh, have you ever heard the word mammon? Come on, any of you King James people? You're like, all right, come on, Pastor, bring the King James. Yes, mammon. And mammon actually came from an Aramaic word uh, that the people of Syria would use to describe the God of money. So some scholars would say that Jesus is actually drawing a connection, not just to riches, but to this principality, this spirit of money, and this need to have finances to be the provider. Because if Jesus was talking about that, it would be the only time that Jesus would compare his spirit to another spirit. It's interesting. Why is that? Because mammon and the spirit of mammon would promise what only God can give. And what we do know for sure is that Jesus is personifying money. And he's saying you can either serve me or you can serve money. And the enemy is trying to get you to look at your money the way God wants you to look at him. This is why it's a problem with Jesus. He's fine. He's got the provision. 
He spoke everything into existence. He's good. The problem he has is when there's anything in our life that takes the place of him as God and provider for our lives. You, and you might think, oh, I don't, I don't think I'd do that. Well, let's just, let's just read a few scriptures that talk about who he is and replace him with this spirit of money and, and, and money. Where does my help come from? My help comes from money. Money is my shepherd. I shall not be in want as long as I have enough. Money is an ever-present help in time of need. Money gives me the peace that passes all understanding. My money shall supply all my needs. A day on Amazon Prime is better than a thousand elsewhere. Now, we may not say those things, but my question is, do we live those things? Is there something about our life that would say on a Sunday we can raise our hands to the God of all creation? God, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then on Monday we're like, yeah, but I need the money. If, if the money doesn't show up, then how is God going to provide? And it's like backwards theology. And this is the problem Jesus has with us choosing money over him. And in this passage, he's literally saying there's a war going on. Who are you going to serve? God or money. You'll either love the one or you'll hate the other. I find it interesting that God is connecting who you serve with love. This is a heart issue. And he's saying, listen, if you serve money, you'll end up hating me. If you love me and serve me, or if you serve me, you'll love me. This is a big deal because when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment of all was, what did he say? In Matthew 22, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first commandment. The first commandment is to love God. And the way we love God is we serve God. And as we serve God, we love him more. And the problem that Jesus is pointing out is if you start serving money, your love for God will wane. And you'll start to love the money. You'll love the provision. This is the problem. It's interesting that Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, uh, if you've heard the story of how Jesus was tempted in the desert by the devil, one of the temptations was the enemy brought him up to a high place where he could see all the kingdoms of the world, all the riches of the world, all the power of the world. Jesus was tempted by mammon. What's Jesus' response? Oh, you're off. Because ever since Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, it has been said that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And him only shall you serve. Serving God and loving God are connected. Serving God and loving God are connected. I'll say it this way. You can't love God and serve your money. You can't love God and serve money. He's drawing a line in the sand. And we're serving our money whenever we're asking, like, I'm looking for, or we're serving our money whenever we're looking for anything other than God to be our source. I'm serving my money when I get agitated when tithes and offerings come up. Just, I mean, like, I was joking about the thing in the spine, but if something inside of your heart gets agitated, there might be a serving issue. I feel fearful when God asked me to get generous. Hey, I've, I know that feeling, but it's the war between who am I going to serve, money or God? So I have to highlight and address. I, I, I feel like Chase really nailed it. Like there were certain times where they had to draw a line in the sand and say, this is the moment. Are we going to choose it? Are we going to trust him or not? I have to address the, where, where money's coming at me and saying, well, why don't you come and worship me a little bit? When I get angry with God over bills or when things break, I might be serving money. Because Jesus is saying you'll either love the one or hate the other. And if stuff doesn't go right and you're like, well, I tried to tithe and you, everything's breaking around here. Thanks, God. Maybe money is a little bit of a stronghold in our lives. Maybe we're serving money. Again, this is a hard issue. Money is not the problem. Serving money is. 
Serving is connected to loving. Serving money is the problem. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money. We, all, we get that one wrong. Have you ever heard, heard it quoted? Well, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's not what he's saying. Or, he's, or the money is the root of all evil. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the love of money, the, when you love it, when you need it, money is your provider. Money is, is going to take care of me. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Serve money, you're going to love money. Serve God, you're going to love God. And God invites us not just to receive him as Savior, but to serve him as Lord. And the fruit of a life lived with Jesus as Lord is joy, righteousness, peace. I know, guess what, y'all? I do love my white minivan, <laughs> mostly. But you know what I, I love more than having a van or having, I actually love my Jeep, right? I love my Jeep. But more than that, the Jeep and the van are not my family's provider. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can receive an offering at a church because the church isn't my provider. Does that make sense? Like, God is my provider. I've resolved just like Chase when I was 15 flipping burgers at Burger King. You know what I'm saying? I resolved when it was $3.25 an hour. God's getting Thirty-two fifty, or wait, three? What? How, what is it? I'm just so generous. I multiply by ten. The point is, God is inviting us to know Him this way, to trust Him this way. Like I'm your Father. Do you trust that I'm good? And Jesus concludes his teaching, and I will too, reading out of Matthew 6, and he says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Jesus is saying, don't live like unbelievers. They're dominated right now with a lack of peace. Who's going to pay the bills? How's the next need going to be met? And Jesus is saying, I know how to meet every single need. Don't let your thoughts be dominated by the things the world's thoughts are dominated with. I love how one preacher said it. Anxiety and worry are to money what praise and worship is to God. Worry is your trust in your money. Faith is your trust in your God. So Jesus says, here's the remedy to all this. Seek first his kingdom and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. This morning, I'm not, we're not even getting into some of the details of what it looks for him to be Lord. We're simply asking the question, the number one heart question that I think we need to begin with every single time is who am I serving? Who am I serving? God or money? Jesus is saying seek first him. Seek your God, Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Seek Him. Live righteously. Serve Him. And every other area of your life will be met. I want to challenge and encourage somebody in the room today. God wants you to see Him as an amazingly good Father who can provide right on time. Every single need. Some of you aren't seeing the miracle because you haven't done the serving yet. And you're like, God, where are you? You're so, I, I don't know why my business isn't taking off. I don't know why everything keeps falling apart at home. And he's like, listen, I need to be your God. Seek me first. And I'll add everything else. 
There's an abandonment that comes when you can say, God, you can have everything else. I'll put you first. This morning, that's what God is asking for us. As we're about to get into finances every week, these next couple weeks, I'd encourage you, don't bail out. Don't miss church. Don't all, all of a sudden we have a family vacation. No, you don't. I did the math. That's, you got four of you, that's $8,000. You can't do that by next week. I'm just saying, can we have joy-filled hearts that our Father wants good for us? That this isn't about like, oh, the church just, nope, the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And we're going to war this year, and I'm believing freedom for people in this room. I'm believing life for you, hope for you, joy for you, that you begin to see God as provider of every single need. I could tell story after story in our own lives where we simply said yes to Jesus and he showed up on the other side of our yes. This is the adventure of following him. Oh, let's all stand this morning. And here's what I want to do all across this room. I would love today to, to be a day of commitment for you. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release the pressure valve. We're not going to go ha- heads up, uh, hands up. You know, How many of you are struggling with this? I'm not going to do that this morning. I will say this. I know there are people in this room, family, our church fam, and this is a struggle, and I'm not here to condemn or to beat you over the head. I'm here to say you could leave free today. You could leave filled with joy, righteousness, peace, saying, God, today's the day. We're choosing to serve you. We're not going to serve anyone else. We're going to serve you. So all across this room, if we could have heads bowed, eyes closed. Again, I'm not going to have hands raised today. I'm simply going to say, let's pray together. And if that's you, I would just encourage you, make a holy moment between you and the Lord right now. This is the day. Maybe it's as a couple, maybe it's as a family where you're saying, today's the day. We're going to choose to serve him and him only. So, Father, we come to you. Lord, if there's a need for repentance in our hearts, times that we've held on to the finances and we've said, God, you can have every area of our our lives, but you can't have this. Forgive us, God, because you want to be the God of all of our lives, the God over every part. You want all of our heart, God. And, Lord, we don't want to give the enemy a single foothold of our heart through our finances. So, God, I pray that this would be a church. If you're saying, Jesus, we can only serve one, we choose you today. We choose choose you today. We choose to say yes to you. And I know there's provision. I know there's a good father on the other side of that, that all our needs will be met. But it starts with us surrendering. God, we're going to do that now as we commit to it. And, and church, I would encourage you in this all across this room, we're going to worship one more time together. But let's do that. As we're worshiping, it's the big yes to God. Yes, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve you alone. Let's lift up our voices in agreement.
Jesus is worthy, uh, not just of our praise, but of our trust. And I want to encourage you this morning, if this was a challenging word, I, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And allow the Lord to speak to our hearts, to challenge us, and to draw us closer to Him. So I want to encourage you, serve Him this week. Trust Him. He's got you. He's got you. He's good. At this time, I'm going to invite our prayer teams to come up. I know a lot of times... Uh, Financial needs are, are prayer requests, right? Like, oh, this is going on. If you need prayer for anything, come on up. But especially in this area, we would love to agree with you and pray for you. Otherwise, go and have an incredible week serving the Lord. We'll look forward to seeing you next week as we continue the fight for your finances. We'll see you then.